Hello, welcome to Downstream here on Navarra Media. My name is Aaron Bastani. Thanks for joining us. Before we go any further, I have two things to ask of you. First is to like this video. Second, if you've not already, if you haven't, what the hell is going on? Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Neither cost you a thing, and both mean so much to all of us here at Navarra Media. Really helps get our content even further out. Now, on with the show. At the start of the 20th century, Rosa Luxemburg said that humanity was faced with an alternative between socialism and barbarism. People repeatedly have said that since, but increasingly those words do appear to be somewhat prophetic. And now we're told that the alternative is eco-socialism or neoliberalism. Joining me today are two authors who've written a new book, Planet on Fire, a manifesto for the age of environmental breakdown. They are Matt Lawrence and Laurie Laybourne Langton. Guys, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Um, I'm going to ask you a very simple question here right at the start, which is the book is called A Manifesto for the Age of Environmental Breakdown. Why not just say climate change? What's the difference? The the political imaginary is captivated increasingly by the climate crisis, right? Um, it start, that's happened more and more over the last couple of years, and that just, just does not encapsulate the terrible position that we find ourselves in. As Increasingly, we've seen, again, in, in the last couple of years, particularly things like Extinction Rebellion, that imaginary is opening itself up to conceive of, say, plastic pollution or biodiversity loss or the loss of species or the extinction of species. But it's so much more uh, than that. And we need to see this as an overall destabilization of the natural world. It's the climate crisis. It's what we've done to the nitrogen cycle. It's what we're doing to the water cycle. It's what we're doing to biodiversity. And overall, we've destabilized the, the Earth's natural life support systems, the, the overall conditions that make life, both human and non-human, possible on the planet. But why not just say climate change? Because people know what climate change is. We're environmental breakdown. People go, well, what is that? You know, I look outside, the trees are growing, the grass is there, the sun's out. I mean, does that, does that make this, the, the, an already complex thing more ambiguous? Or do you think that's, there's a really critical point you're trying to convey here? Yeah, because it's more than just just climate change. Uh, it's more than just the climate crisis. It's both more it, it encompasses, like I was saying, biodiversity loss, the destabilization of other systems. And if we don't have publics that are engaged in the full picture of what's happening to the environment, then we're not necessarily going to have the the feedback into politics or the feedback into the behavior of all the institutions that are going to solve this problem. And secondly, change and other words like that are too benign compared to the situation that we find ourselves in. The destabilization of the natural world is surpassing critical thresholds. And by that, I mean, it's getting to the point where it's going to become so destabilized that what agency we can muster as human beings is just not going to be able to be sufficient for being able to bring this back away from a position where we'll end up with globally catastrophic results. Let's talk about the biodiversity aspect for a second, because I read uh, Bill Gates' recent book uh, about climate change. I actually thought it was quite useful. You know, and I said, I, I said mm. some things which went wholly negative. And of course, people say, oh, God, this guy's a stand for Bill Gates and, and Big Pharma. But um, I thought it was useful in a number of ways. But one thing I really disagreed was, was, was this kind of singular focus on reducing CO2 methane emissions. You know, just we just need to decarbonize and then everything is going to be fine. And what you're saying is with this whole idea of environmental breakdown, actually, it's far deeper than that. So can, can you just talk about the importance of biodiversity and what's going on? Because, you know, for some people out there, we just need to decarbonize. You're saying it's not that. So what are these other issues besides reducing and ultimately eliminating the 51 billion tons of fossil fuel emissions we emit every year? Yeah, and I agree that Bill Gates's book was quite good in, in systematizing the climate element of the challenge. But we could decarbonize our economies, all the vehicles, all the you know, production processes and everything. And we'd still be in serious trouble because the other activities in our economy, like producing the food that we eat um, or, or you know, building homes or whatever, could the, the, the impact upon the environment including the destruction of ecosystems, so the habitats in which animals live, which plants are found in, would still be being destroyed by those processes, right? So take the Amazon and the Cerrado, they're often, or at least the Amazon is often in the news. Um, they're being destroyed, not just because of rising temperatures, but they're being destroyed directly by uh, a global food system. You know, basically, you know, the impacts upon the Amazon is connected, intimately connected to the consumer tastes of, say, meat eaters in, in Europe. And then the companies that, that meet that demand and, and also push certain 
uh, ideas of what a, 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 the right kind of lifestyle is on those people. And so we could, all of that could be decarbonized, a plane that would then take the, the packed meat over from South America to Europe and then the processing and the distribution of it to then the restaurants that are run by renewable energy. But it, we'd still be in a seriously catastrophically dangerous environmental situation because we're crushing through those habitats, clearing rainforests to make way for cattle. And that is multiplied all around the world. And so we cannot do this if we just take out the emissions part. And the Bill Gates book was very interesting in many ways, but it's, it's just shining a spotlight on this overall storm that is engulfing the world that, that encapsulates so much more than just the climate crisis. Matt Lawrence, what's your take on that? Well, I think in terms of, you know, why it has to be more than just the climate crisis is partly because of the compounding age that Laurie mentions, but, you know, just look around us. So, you know, COVID-19 is in some ways the first major global crisis of environmental breakdown, or at least, you know, a crisis at the speed and scale, because it's, you know, its drivers really is capitalism's entanglement of natural systems, of, you know, biodiversity, of deforestation, into cycles of accumulation. And that was sort of the proximate cause that drove sort of the zoonotic transfer, the sort of movement of, you know, the COVID sort of, you know, sort of stream from, you know, was it pangolins uh, through bats into human <laughs> life size and then sort of, you know, sent around the world via sort of, you know, carbon based uh, mobility in the form of planes. And so, you know, just looking around us, we can see that actually it's not enough just to say, well, actually, just what we need to do is decarbonize because that, that would be enough. We actually need to think about the widest sort of uh, interconnected and compounding sort of set of environmental breakdowns that are happening at the same time. And I think that takes you to the second part, which is that actually, you know, this is not, you know, we have to decarbonize absolutely, but the, so we've got to recognize what the sort of driver of this is, which is a sort of extractive and propulsive model of capitalism that sort of seeks to commodify and transform all of nature into sort of the profit-making process, sort of transform sort of uh, uncommodified labor, uncommodified labor, and nature into sort of, you know, sort of uh, commodity forms into wealth. And that is such a sort of propulsive driver that we need to, in that sort of moment of decarbonization, reimagine deeply the institutions that organize our economy if we're going to have a sort of chance of cutting the drivers of not just emissions but environmental breakdown in the round yeah i think andres malm who we've, we've not had the pleasure of having on actually on downstream yet um who, who's written i think he's prodigious you know i think he's now yes, on his Chris. third book to do, yeah. with, to do with covid i've just got yeah. a, a, yeah. i just got a new pr uh, proof copy of his uh yeah. of his new book coming out with the it's, zetkin collective it's very very good <laughs> not yeah, to, and, and, to promote another book <laughs> Yeah, no, it is very good from what I've, I've sort of breezed over it. But in his previous book about the sort of, um, the, you know, he, he equates what's needed to happen with COVID-19 to war communism. And he, and he says, you know, the problem here is that we're inserting all of nature, the entirety of nature, as you said, into these circuits of capital. What is that? It's money making money. It's fundamentally about instrumentalizing the entirety of the natural world. And by the way, beyond it, if we ever get to that thing I'm so keen on, which is space asteroids, uh, you know, asteroid mining and resource extraction beyond other planets. For now, we're limited to this planet uh, and it's entirely subordinated to that logic. So I guess, which leads me on to that, that next question is, can we avert environmental breakdown while keeping capitalism? Because if I'm trying to be really contrarian here, I could just say, well, look, okay, fine. We need to decarbonize. Let's do the Bill Gates thing. And we all need to become vegetarians. But that doesn't mean we have to ditch capitalism. Look, there's two things here. There's a sort of technical challenge of how we decarbonize, and then there's the political challenge of how you mobilize the power to overcome the entrenched interests that would inhibit that sort of technical decarbonization or the bringing in sort of natural limits of economic systems. On the first point of technical questions, I think in Malmes' sort of, you know, his argument of like the stock versus the flow, so the stock of fossil fuels versus the flow of renewable energy, there's a set, a set of contradictions in how capitalism, in how the sort of profit making sort of operates. Uh, you know, for example, in that book you mentioned about the chronic emergency, he talks about sort of like um, companies that are sort of sucking uh, carbon out of the air, but then rather than just sort of sucking it out of the air, what they're then doing is then selling it as sort of, you know, sort of uh, fizz for like carbonated uh, water because they need a commodity to make profit out of. So they're actually just like taking it out of the air, but then putting it back into exchange. So like there's some certain contradictions in if you're trying to sort of do this transition through, you know, uh, publicly traded corporations that are by law and by design, built to sort of maximize profits and therefore to extract wealth, to extract value from nature and labor. I think there's a sort of real challenge there technically about how you can do it under sort of certainly the capitalism as we know it. You know, we need much more forms of democratic planning, sort of socialization of investment, a whole suite of things that really challenge sort of the nature of capitalism as we know it. 
But then I think importantly, on the sort of political point, if you're going to do this sort of epochal civilizational transformation to build a sort of society of you know, post-carbon plenty, you're going to have to mobilize, you know, in 2019 and before, you know, in, in 2020 and sort of GND movement and across the world, we've seen sort of attempts to do this. But if you're going to sort of mobilize people, you've got to offer more than just, well, we can just decarbonize today's economy and that's it. In that process of reimagining, surely there's a political opportunity to mobilize a coalition to say it's not enough just to sort of decarbonize sort of existing capitalism with all its inequalities and failures and inefficiencies. Actually, it's about building both a decarbonized but also a democratized economy. And that's how we sort of build the political coalition necessary to overcome sort of fossil capital. Laurie? I think this year could be a kind of ground zero for a status quo Trumpfism, uh, a feeling, say, at the UN uh, climate conference that we have in Glasgow at the end of the year, COP26, where everyone's slapping themselves on the back. They're very pleased that Biden has been elected in the US. These are positive things, of course. Many countries sign up to net zero targets, some of which are by 2025 or 2030. And you get this sort of modified approach to the neoliberal paradigm we have at the moment that basically finally says we're going to give this a go. And we're going to start to swap dirty technology for clean alternatives. And we're going to try and get the market incentives right to make sure that happens at a sufficient speed and scale. And over the course of the decade, it's probably going to smash up against the reality that many people are predicting for a very long time. Uh, and I think there are three factors there that, that constitute that. One is power, as Matt is saying. We had a sort of a feeling of this um, earlier on this year when Mark Carney had delivered, your know, former governor of Bank of England, had delivered this, these researchers, these BBC researchers, and talked about the kind of changes that we need to the current neoliberal paradigm to be able to swap essentially dirty for clean as quick as possible. And then he got embroiled in this sort of scandal where he talked about how his hedge fund management company uh, had chosen not to invest in certain types of, of dirty technology, and that meant that it itself overall was net zero. And that sort of speaks to the, the problems that in practice decarbonization is going to face when it is focused too much upon trying to get market actors to, to behave in a certain way. The second area is consumption. And this is where the fact that this isn't just a climate crisis really comes to bite. Because as we were saying earlier, you could decarbonize all of this stuff. You could have all of those cleaner technologies in terms of the carbon problem, but we'd still be speeding towards this astonishing global catastrophe if we're doing all the other elements of consumption that is driving that, right? And that's that's before you even have to question whether or not we've got enough carbon room, as it were, to swap all of that dirt if we're clean. And there are some big questions about that. And then the third big barrier is, is equality. How are you going to do it? How are you going to maintain the extraordinary global cooperation need in countries and between countries if you're not dealing with feelings of injustice and actual existing injustices and the status quo, even a modified version of that, doesn't seem to have a proper answer. So it, capitalism, whatever happens, is going to look different in the coming years because of the environmental crisis and because of the certain changes that we're going to need to even be able to conceive of dealing with it. I suppose the counterfactual is that, you know, we've had a massive transition before. We've had several massive transitions. But the most recent one was from feudalism to capitalism. You know, over the course of the last, you know, it starts maybe 500 years ago, but for most of the world over the last 250 years. And that was done with a great deal of violence, completely undemocratic. Um, and that's the kind of paradigm shift we're going to have to do now. So I wonder, because, you know, at, towards the middle of the book, you start talking about eco-fascism. And it, it does feel to me that we are in right now a period, I think, you know, this gr a great dithering. The idea that there's anything remotely resembling the kind of action we need to do in climate change is, is laughable, right? Even the most radical proposals right now coming out from the Biden administration are laughable. They're sort of, I think they're almost contemptible to anybody who's kind of serious about this stuff. And so it does feel to me that like from 1990, maybe to the middle of this century, nobody's actually in power who's serious about dealing with this thing. And so it, it does kind of come back to this, well, if the status quo won't, and the left, as we'll, we'll talk about, perhaps doesn't, it doesn't look like it has the social power to do that. I mean, I don't think that's inevitable. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't be writing the book. But it, it, it does feel like that actually this attachment to the status quo is is really potentially enabling the rise of eco-fascism. Can you talk a little bit more about that, the rise of eco-fascism in this context of neoliberalism failing to provide answers to the climate crisis? Yeah, in, in, in the book, we we argued that you could, if, if you look at the sort of the powers that be that are arrayed around the world at the moment, you've got a few 
tribes that you can discern. You've got the status quo neoliberalism, which as we discussed is sort of going through, you could argue a modification to properly recognize at least the climate element of the crisis. You've then got uh, what we call denialist conservatives, like for example, the, the former Trump administration. And then you've got this open kind of eco nativist fascist approach, right? The, the first of, and we, we argued in the book that as things get worse, the first two could start to fold into the final one. So, for example, take someone like Emmanuel Macron, who we'd very much put in the status quo neoliberal element, even if he's starting to potentially experiment, at least rhetorically, with some kind of modification on the status quo. They don't talk about this as being an overall destabilization of the natural world, as you're alluding to, they're not introducing policies that are the, the sufficient level of systemic change, which, by the way, the scientific community, this is often not reported, the scientific community is very clear about and saying we need changes in paradigms, goals, technology, everything needs to be, be moving and very fast. And while that's going on um, and, you know, talking about making the planet great again, as Macron has done, then pumping money into Frontex, the European border force, in a way that does not fill you with confidence that we're going to react um, as benevolent as we need to, to people who are going to be forcibly displaced, or at least in response to the spectre of huge force displacement that is, you know, often thrown up by the far right or by, in a different way, by multilateral organizations. As things get worse, you, it, it's not hard to imagine a situation where there's a sort of militarized, securitized, knee-jerk reaction to things getting worse and the desire to pivot to appeal to populations that are very scared, understandably, and are being appealed to by, by the harder right will mean that that kind of status quo neoliberalism begins to nudge itself more and more in that direction. And you just need to look at the so-called migrant crisis of the 2010s in Europe to have seen the sort of prelude to that, right? One minute you've got politicians over here talking about making the planet great again, and then over here you've got the reprehensible treatment of people in the Mediterranean, and you've got, you know, the British government putting Royal Naval Destroyers in the channel and saying there's a migration, there's a massive crisis because a few people are trying to reach these shores. And that does not set us up well for what comes next. So we're concerned that as things get much more destabilized, which they will, that we will end up with this sort of retreat to that eco-nativism. And it, it, it doesn't take much of a stretch of imagination to imagine a, a millennial version of Trump standing up and saying, liberal elites sold you out. This was always a disaster. It's now become a global catastrophe and we've just got to protect what's left and keep the others out. And that is, would be horrific in and itself, but would be globally catastrophic because that would probably be a situation where global cooperation has partly evaporated and then we're, we're in a serious trouble because those feedback loops, natural feedback loops, overwhelm us at that point. Matt, what's your take on that? Because uh, it does feel instinctively to me that actually that could be a very popular politics in 10, 20, 25 years. I mean, I don't think we need to wait 25 years uh, for that type of politics to really metacize on the on this of course we're going on. I mean, I think if you actually recall back to sort of Macron, Le Pen, sort of um, in what was it, two, I got time passes anyway, 2012, the election, and there's that sort of meme going around, you know, this time Macron, next time Le Pen. What we're seeing with the polls right now, that sort of 52, 48 was the last one in the second round. You're seeing that sort of beginning in some sort of uh, political sort of formations to come to pass, um, or at least on that trajectory. I think that's what one of our arguments is that actually in this context of compounding environmental breakdown, sort of laced through with like stark inequalities that are generated by design by our economic systems, the sort of much more radical and disruptive sort of way forward is not a deep reimagining from sort of eco-socialist sort of trajectory of our society, it's actually mm. the status quo. It's actually saying, you know what, actually in the face of all these challenges, in the need for that, you know, science has been telling us for decades for the sort of deep paradigm shifts that Laurie mentioned that you were alluding to, Aaron, in the face of all this, you know what we're going to do is, we're going to just keep ploughing on. We're going to have a bit of a tinker here, we're going to have a bit of a tweak there, but it'll be okay. And then we can sort of combine that with, you know, what is it, sort of fascism, sort of some sort of you know, hierarchical sort of valorization of certain lives and sort of the racialization of human lives and that violent policing. Now, you could say there's echoes of that already, certainly in the Mediterranean and other places already. But you sort of combine that through a pressure cooker of a billion people on the move. You combine that through sort of a world of like resource scarcity. You combine that through sort of, you know, the failure of 
you know, sort of, you know, the neoliberal growth model for another sort of 10, 15, 20 years, you know, Europe, you know, look at, look at the budget the other day, it was sort of set for another sort of 10 years, 20 years of sort of low wage growth in this country. So our argument is really like, actually, it's the status quo that is the really dangerous response to these conditions. It both gave rise to where we are, but also can't solve them. And in that context, you can see this fusing together, which the Malm book does really well in, in real depth, this fusing together of sort of like a radicalized right with sort of, you know, the sort of uh, remnants of fossil capital combined with sort of nationalist sort of policing and stratification, really violent policing of borders and the castle state, and the, the sort of ramping up even further of what we already have, which is already sort of incredibly bleak. And so, you know, you combine all those forces together, and that really does suggest that actually it's much safer if you care about, you know, base, you know, it should, and this is why it should be a big political coalition. If you care about sort of supposedly basic norms of democracy, human rights, you know, humane treatment, et cetera, Actually, really, the spirit of both it isn't just about the left. The left should be able to build out from it and say, well, actually, if you care about any of these things, the status quo is exactly the thing that will erode and make these things impossible if we continue on the trajectory that it's setting us on, on the policies, the institutions, the sort of objectives that its politics is generating. But, I mean, you, people don't care, do they? I mean, p politicians, moderate politicians don't care. I mean, they might may acknowledge the reality of, of climate change, but in terms of the sixth, sixth great extinction, you know, I mean, when you look at the scale of what's headed our way, you don't need to be an extinction rebellion kind of activist to realise that we are, we are facing a huge series of existential challenges over the next several decades, over the next century. And yet, actually, the political centre doesn't really doesn't really care. You know, in this country, Labour are talking about we'll give subsidies to have electric cars. That's their big offer. What, what do you make of that policy in particular, for instance? I mean, I raise that because, of course, Labour in 2019 were offering probably the most radical vision we've seen in response to the climate crisis. And obviously, they've been very light on policy. Some people think that's good, some think that's bad, but whatever. But this is kind of one of the few sort of tentative policies we've seen towards the climate crisis. Where's your where's your standard? Is it not good enough? Are these the kinds of things we we need, uh, or is it you know is it reflective actually of a politics which is just completely out of touch with the problem? Yeah, so I think transport is a really interesting one, mobility in the round because it's really sort of the vector, the modality by which sort of race, class, identity, whole sort of uh, host of trends sort of filtered and forced through. So you can think of sort of environmental racism and its relationships sort of you know, the combustion engine and how we build sort of. Um, you know, sort of highway infrastructures. I saw uh, Mayor Pete got in trouble about that the other day, but he was obviously completely right that sort of, you know, how we build fossil fuel infrastructures is laced through, and including mobility infrastructures, laced through sort of the racialized sort of uh, politics. And so in some ways, you know, to, to sort of step back and answer the mobility question, but also your question about like, well, you know, sort of no one seems to be sort of speaking to this. And, you know, the electric vehicle announced the other day, spoke to, you know, Labour's internal political economy with, you know, trade unions and sort of, you know, unite sort of uh, electric vehicles, sort of uh, manufacturing plants, et cetera. But, you know, I think there's a chance it's actually people sort of struggle to comprehend the scale of it because it seems very large scale. It seems in some ways abstract. There's sort of, you know, the problem of sort of time versus, you know, the present. And so, so what we try and do in the book is, you know, we take an example of mobility and we try and sort of say, well, what concretely could we do that would be transformative, that would be, you know, about sort of a purposeful expansion of, you know, capability, of the means of everyone to enjoy a good life. So there, you know, try, mobility it would be, you know, instead of potentially like just more and more sort of electric vehicles in the transition, you know, just swapping combustion engines for electric vehicles, it would be about reimagining cities as mobility commons. Is. So, you know, sort of uh, decommodified public transport, that's all electric vehicles, expansion of cycling networks, expansion of sort of walking networks. And we sort of refer to Timothy Mitchell, uh, sort of a UK historian of, sort of empire and sort of uh, fossil fuel economy, around how in the 50s, the transition in Europe and in the US to really car intensive modes of mm. travel wasn't just like random because people wanted to get into cars, you know, it's because there's a really active effort on the part of like major Fordist sort of corporations, most obviously Ford, to really embed fossil intensive modes of transport. And so like, you know, everything is political and therefore we should say, well, actually, there's no reason why, you know, of course it's, it seems natural, but we've got to reject that naturalization and say with mobility, with our food systems, with how we organize the corporation and work, how we organize our sort of, you know, everything really. We need to say actually, Let's go to the root of this and re-pick and rewire these if it's failing to deliver on that question of equity and the question of sort of transition. And mobility is a really good way of saying actually we need to be much more expansive and I think actually much more compelling in that process. So what what do you make of I'll, I'll ask Laurie the same question as well. What do you make of the Labour policy? Do you think it's 
inadequate? Do you think it's a start? I mean, because it's the kind of policy which is a green policy, but I wonder if you think it's appropriate or goes far enough. I think that it, 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 it's, it should be seen as a subset of an overall transition that we need to do. It's, it's a good start. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that probably should have been happening when I was born about three decades ago. Um, and as Matt is saying, it, it's not part of a bigger picture of how we transition, say, mobility, which is, uh, the root is accessibility to certain opportunities um, across society. Uh, and how we transition that both to deal with environmental constraints, but also to maximize the benefits of doing so. I work with some of the leading health organizations uh, in the UK and in a climate alliance a couple of years ago. And many of them have been arguing for huge changes in how we plan our economies and societies for probably about a century anyway. And wonderfully, those are the same things that will also help us deal with the environmental crisis. And that we haven't done them already is itself completely bareful. And I think it... It's, it's dismaying, but also understandable that our current politics now is itself not going to be able to be the thing that gets us out of the mess that it has essentially brought us into. And we've had two big trends in the last, what, 30 to 40 years. We've had politicians essentially abdicating their role as big, positive, structural agents of change within economies. And we didn't necessarily, at least in a massive scale, at least in, in the West, have a kind of social political movement that sat behind environmental politics, right? It, it was often a niche thing, sometimes isolated to middle classes. Um, you know, green politics was often disparaged and mocked by the mainstream. And that is starting to shift. And it provides us with an amazing moment of, of renewal and energy as we begin to experiment with what a, a true social and political movement in a mass sense could be around the environmental imperative. And as ever, there's a huge amount to learn, not just from the things that catch the headlines in the US, but also examples of this across the world, where people in the communities that have always been on the front line have been the ones who are struggling with not just alternative visions, but the movements that are trying to bring them into reality as well. Do you, do you think that sort of that disposition to a positive affect, oh, this is changing, this crisis, we're going to come together, things will never be the same. Do you, do you think that's kind of counterproductive? Because it seems to me that actually we've, we've gone backwards over the last 50, 60 years, particularly on mobility. You know, most towns and cities in the UK, I think, had better public transit networks before I was born than they do today. They may have had trams. Uh, they were, you know, there was a greater ability to walk from one place to the other. Uh, I think, you know, there was an amazing chart I saw a, a couple of weeks ago. I'd heard of the story already, but of the fact that, yes, while in London, um, the volume of people using buses has gone up, up over the last 20 years, outside of London, for the rest of England, it's gone massively down. And it does feel to me that people think that we're making progress, but actually we, it, we are really going backwards really quickly. That's not to say there aren't tangible success stories like Britain, for instance, reducing its uh, median carbon emissions per person. But I suppose one thing that's really absent in the book is you don't mention China. And I find this interesting because obviously China is a huge source of emissions. That's because it's home to 1.3 billion people. But it's also the place which is built 35,000 miles of high-speed rail networks. It's also the place where you have in Shenzhen, a city, I think 17,000 electric taxis, 12,000 electric buses. Those are the precise numbers, but that's the ballpark. And it's the kind that's the kind of thing we now need to be doing in the West and we're not. And yet China in this book is, is kind of absent. And, and I'm wondering why, because you know we're talking about big advanced economies at the forefront of transitioning away from fossil fuels. And yes, China is opening all these coal mines and you know it burns more coal than any other country, but it's doing some other stuff as well, which frankly is leaving Europe in the dust. You know, so so yeah. why why not the mention of of China, given it's doing so much so quickly? So, so so two quick things. So one on the bus chart, which was really interesting. I think that's exactly why there is sort of, you know, positive story to tell because the reason that like that line went like that as you mentioned wasn't just like random it was because of politics it was because of decisions to sort of deregulate sort of the bus market so actually that's exactly an example of, like mobility is not something that descends like manna from the heavens it's actually constructed and we can reshape it on china i mean I think partly i mean laurie bowen stuff in second but it yeah, partly it's because we're not china experts it was written for an audience of like activists and movements you know in the global north broadly mm. what we say we you know we sort of refer to like the sort of you know the sort of beijing model which is sort of you know in some, a replacement particularly for countries in the global south to uh you know the failed washington consensus so this is looking at things like you know sort of state-led sort of uh investment 
for development of renewables and sort of green industries. It's about capital controls. It's about sort of breaking with some of those you know, axiomatic fundamentals that have governed a sort of liberalized political economy globally. I, mean, I think the problem, you know, China's sort of also, you know, sort of uh, trade wars is class wars book. You know, there's, it's sort of got a really interesting and sort of both positive uh, role in international political economy, extraordinary, you know, Michael can attest to this extraordinary achievement in reducing poverty, so Michael Walker, but also, you know, there's a whole host of so, you know, dangerous sort of problematics within its, you know, economic model, you know, it sort of uh, represses real wages for workers, it, you know, the whole host of things. And of course, it's, you know, despite adding a hell of a lot of, um, you know, renewable sort of uh, stock, uh, sort of on top of the existing stock, it's still continuing to expand hugely sort of um, carbon stocks. So if you look at the One Belt, One Road initiative, this sort of Global infrastructure investment, which is where a lot of the sort of accumulated savings of uh, Chinese workers is going towards. This is an incredibly carbon intensive uh, piece of infrastructure equipment. So this is not care as infrastructure. This is old fashioned fossil fuel infrastructure just being built as a sort of road around the world for a sort of export commodity driven economic strategy. So I think, you know, on China, it's like it's obviously hugely important. And it's kind of there in the background as it has to be in any sort of book about you know, contemporary capitalism in the future of the planet in the 21st century but it was sort of you know in some ways deliberately not trying to say like hey we're experts on this we're going to go into this but yeah i, I definitely take the point but I'll, I'll ask this of laurie then a kind of variation on the former question which is you know we, we know that sort of these market driven states who've sort of been subordinated to the washington consensus they clearly don't want to do this transition even if they wanted to do it they don't seem to be able to do it quickly enough because of the various competing interests i mean there's an argument to be made here which is well actually you know it's time for the Beijing consensus. And that's not to say I'm going to excuse or apologize everything that's going on in China, but this, this fundamental idea that there's a transaction between personal civil liberties and giving power to a state in China, it's a one-party state, well, it's a one-party government. I mean, I don't want to get into any arguments about the other political parties in China. Um, and ultimately, what we've the evidence of the last 20 years is this is the only nation state capable of acting at the kind of scale and extent we, we are talking about here, which we all agree is the, is the kind of scale and extent which is necessary to avoid systems breakdown. Do you, do you not think that's going to be a temptation for Europe, the United States, even if it was driven by the left over the next 10 years to look more like China? Yeah, I, th I know it already is a, a, a huge temptation. You, you have people across who would associate themselves with caring about the environmental crisis that have always talked about China and how we need to be much more like China. Um, one, a, a big question that I, an open question that I have is that has China actually been that good at it? Um, we, we need to be reducing emissions hugely. China's not necessarily been doing that. It's very welcome mm -hmm. that it's got the scale, its ability to scale things and it's signing up to net zero. That's positive. But the follow through on that is a huge question mark, as we saw with the latest five year plan, which didn't necessarily go as far into exploring how it's going to deliver on those promises. But again, this is just the climate bit of it, right? At the end of the day, a lot of that Chinese model at home is still based upon compounding material consumption and stretching that out across the population in, in a kind of Western conception of what that looks like. And the environmental impacts of that are catastrophic, increasingly catastrophic. And they're not isolated just to China either because of production processes. Um, we see this in, you know, complicit in the kind of supply chain networks that we're talking about in the context of COVID, right? You've got the destruction of, of megafauna in Africa to feed certain markets in China. And they want to be expanding that sort of Western conception of consumption more and more over the course of meeting this net zero target. And that's not even... You know, that, that's a level of destruction that uh, is is above and beyond what 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 the planet can sustain sustain before you even talk about the the, the one road one belt initiative that that Matt is talking about. And the other thing I'd say, and that, that it wasn't just the reason that we we are much more immersed in the policy debates in the UK and in the US primarily that we had the focus mainly on them. It's also because I think a lot of the things that we can and should be doing right now are already at our fingertips. I listened the other day to the interview that you did with Mar Mariana Matakatu, and there are these astonishing stories about the ability for countries like the US to be able to push the technological development and the scale of rollout mm. that's needed across the economy. And we should be visiting the, the positive stories that we have at home alongside having a recognition of what's going on in the rest of the world. And it, it just, the immense frustration that I got when I listened to that podcast of Mariana extends all, all the time that we, we're unable to bring about these incredibly inspiring stories 
from close to home about how we can we can deliver enormous change. And so I think we also, as well as being aware of what else is going on in the world, we need to look at how a lot of this stuff from, for example, mobility changes in cities like you're talking about, all the way up to the national scale, a lot of those positive stories, the methods of doing it, the policies, we have them in our in our history here. So, so give me some good news stories. Uh, I'll start with you, Laurie, because you made the point. I thought that was a really good answer from both of you, by the way, on China. I'm, I'm inclined to agree, really. Um, give me some good news stories. Who is doing good things on climate, which should be an inspiration to cities, regions, nations around the world? The first thing I'd say is that a lot of the people are doing good stuff. Um, you won't necessarily see it as being related to the climate and wider environmental emergency. Often we get, we're seeing around the world changes in political economy that start to create the foundation for bigger changes elsewhere. An off quote example is for is New Zealand exploring the idea of allocating a, a, a relatively small part of its government budget on mm. other things that aren't just the maximization of GDP or other things in their cost benefit calculus. And that is, that's really important. It hasn't necessarily been couched in terms of environmental factors, but it starts to break this consensus, at least in countries similar like the UK over here, that we should be making decisions based upon a different set of metrics. And that could be profound. It won't save things. You know, you won't suddenly change the objective of the economy and everything works in a different way. But that is a hugely positive, a potential positive thing that could be going on. The way that cities are being replanned, not just by planners and policymakers, but also by communities who are often at the front line of doing that is itself a very positive thing. So in not just London, we have increasingly instances of people beginning to move away from you know, the use of roads just for cars, of all, a whole palette of mobility options, of different models of, of ownership and delivery for doing that, like we're seeing Andy Burnham talking about when it comes to um, more public involvement in, say, the bus network up in Manchester. And they are completely disproportionate to the scale of the challenge. We have to be completely honest about that. But, you know... This has always been, sadly, about concurrent battles of shifting our political economy, which then opens up the ability to properly give this a go. And then we're going to have to do that while grappling with the growing destabilization that we see all around us. And on the first step, I'm seeing lots of, of positive changes. It, it would have been unimaginable to have the kind of debates that we often see in mainstream policy circles, some of which we've dipped into. Uh, in, in the last year around the efficacy of, of just focusing purely on, on compounding rates for economic growth, the ability for states to finance themselves beyond this juvenile focus on this deficit myth. These are big moments, potential big changes, and they're the best we got. And they're full with hope and opportunity. And we find ourselves in a moment of different potential than, say, 40 years ago when there were similar signs of a paradigm shift as we headed towards mm -hmm. the Thatcher-Reagan era. And we have to recognize that for those of us who, have, who are a part of progressive politics, that you know, the, the opportunities inherent are huge and they need to be the grass in the same way that the right grass them in the 70s and the 80s. I, I suppose leading from that, you want to come in, did you, Matt? Yeah, well, why not? Um, <laughs> it's good, good to be positive sometimes. No, I mean, I think just, so one of the book chapters um, focuses on sort of commoning and the commons and how we can democratically steward resources, whether it's land, whether it's cities, whether it's mobility, whether it's technologies, intellectual property, which obviously COVID vaccine is very relevant. But it kind of opens with actually with Bolsonaro and his kind of like uh, opening up of the Amazon uh, and sort of you know, the big fires that they sort of let loose in uh, sort of 2018. And Bolsonaro, you know, his regime obviously epitomizes in some ways that like linkage between the far right and sort of fossil capital that us and others have explored. But I think one of the positive things there, you know, against the fact that like this, you know, commons as a vital carbon sink, home to huge biodiversity, home to millions of people, you know, on the one hand, that's being opened up and sort of exactly drawn into these commodity, you know, cycles of commodity exchange and capital accumulation and sort of devastation of nature and so sort of all the sort of terrible blowbacks. That's not the positive story. But the positive story is actually, um, if you look at what's sort of happened under Lula and uh, under Dilma, actually there was a process by which there was actually reforestation happened with Amazon. Mm. There was reforestation and that was based on sort of commoning based approaches about sort of returning land out of sort of, you know, sort of circuits of exchange, sort of circuits of financialization and returning it to stewardship by indigenous communities who after all have sort of 
stewarded the sort of and lived and communed with the forest for you know time immemorial and actually that process actually really began to sort of regrow the forest and frankly the amazon you know we have this line in the book about like you know, capitalism you know sees a forest and creates a desert or you know, i can't even remember what we wrote but it was a good line in the book but anyway you know and it basically that is the front line if we can if that if the amazon goes then really you know we are in re it's just extraordinary trouble um but at the same time we show just we, even in the last decade or so the politics and social movements in sort of a key sort of you know nodal point in the global south could actually begin to sort of push back against the logics that have got to this point. And so that's the source of hope. And obviously, you know, there's a Brazilian election coming up, which is going to be, you know, fundamental to the future of the planet in many ways. And exactly that example I would point to as one example, but amongst many, of how new models of stewardship, of democratic management of shared resources, of sort of listening and prioritizing the needs and sort of experiences and life worlds of sort of like non-Western, non-sort of you know, capitalist modes of development can actually really sort of begin to recover a different trajectory to the one we're on. But Matt, when, when Lula was um, incarcerated wrongly, when there was effectively a political coup against the mm. Workers' Party in, in Brazil, you know, most, most people in Britain who claim to care about climate change cheered it on. You know, most sort of centrists, moderates, most of the intelligentsia, all they didn't care, right? So, I mean, yeah. I wonder, you're saying, look, we, we actually have some good news stories. It turns out one of them went to prison and for, for something he didn't do. And the reason being, of course, and it gets the center of this conversation, because, of course, the book's about policy, but policy happens in the context of politics, and politics is about competing interests. And so there are obviously a great deal of interests, and this is why it's so hard to break with the status quo, around fossil capitalism, around hydrocarbons, around private ownership. How do we break that when the interests are so incredibly powerful well resourced you talked about for instance the Koch brothers but that's just a that's just a, a a drop in the ocean in terms of of how this system reproduces itself often with consent yeah absolutely so i mean we also use the example of the 70s how like the impasse and the sort of crisis of the 70s was kind of seized by the right and sort of you know broken through by into neoliberal sort of uh, regimes um into the 80s and beyond and we kind of of course, applied in very different ways, but there are potential lessons there. So, you know, picking up some of them, you know, there's an immense amount of prefiguration. So if you look at some of the iconic policies of, um, you know, sort of Thatcherism, right to buy, for example, this didn't come out of nowhere. It was trialed in Battersea and other places, and it's kind of proved. So can we begin in sort of green cities and, you know, around the world sort of, you know, really make green municipal sort of movements actually prefigure and show the future that we're trying to bring to bear and be incubators of the future. There's a real intense of obviously sort of networking of social movements and mm -hmm. so like sort of culturally conservative social movements, but then combining that through to sort of you know the Tufton Street complex in the UK, so like the think tanks of uh, Centre for Policy Studies, Adam Smith Institute, uh, yeah. and, you know, so all of those guys. Really intense coordination. So you know, this is not to say that we just need a Montpellier and sort of thing, but there was obviously like coordination of the intellectual and social movements that sort of fed into sort of neoliberal break. And I think an important part of the story, you know, you could extend this to say the Volcker shock in the US, which is in some ways the key moment in the breaking of the inflation regime or the switch from inflation regime of sort of Keynesian wage growth, low asset inflation to no wage growth, high asset inflation. Mm -hmm. Key moment. You know, well, shock. So that's when interest rates uh, shot up in the US under the Federal Reserve. That was about you know the conscious planning and redirection of our economic model and so sort of the inflation regime in the US via sort of you know a politics of planning. So what we need in some ways is a politics when set power and democratize that planning, the planning function of central banking, the planning function contained inherently within corporations and sort of non-market forms of organization, democratize that planning and sort of begin to reorientate it. So then we've got incredible tools there, got incredible tools there. So you're right, exactly. We've got incredible tools in central bank and, uh, and finance. If we can bring it under democratic control, we can begin to make real progress. But that, that, that's the tension. We argue in the book that the, you know, the climate and env environmental crisis is overwhelmingly a political crisis, a crisis of power and power inequality, rather than a crisis of technical solutions. So if somebody's watching this and they, they care about climate change, and obviously the book is a manifesto, but it's it's very broad brush and that's not a criticism. It's you know, you're talking a, a, in a very in broad terms. What would the what would the the sort of further steps that you would suggest be to a, a regular person just watching this? Uh, I'll start with you, Laurie. What can they do to avert, you know, climate <laughs> catastrophe? <laughs> they um 
they they need to make sure that they're understanding how this is a problem of systems as well as a problem of individuals uh, and can recognize their agency as an individual to try and change those systems. That means primarily learning about the the true nature of the challenge itself, that it's not just a climate crisis, that it's not just a problem of the last 50 years, but a problem of the last 500 years. And then understanding how in moments of potential profound change that, that Matt's talking about, the previous one that we had in the 70s and 80s, there are all sorts of opportunities across what you could probably describe as an ecosystem of influence that can lead to a big tipping point moment in politics that you can get yourself associated with. So, you know, go and be go and be a part of everything that clearly has is bringing agency to bear on changing systems. So that's from a, a local cooperative energy startup or how your your local street may be campaigning to have the road, the amount of traffic going down the road reduced to reduce the amount of air pollution and the use of, of certain vehicles, all the way through to trying to be part of a political party being part of, say, a policy organization that is pushing for these bigger shifts and recognize that within that, the, the potential for change now, and in many respects, the pace of change is greater than we've seen for quite a long time. One of the examples of a positive story that we use in the book is the example of the National Health Service uh, in the UK. It was It's only been about 10 years that the, the NHS has even had a part of it that thinks about sustainability. And it's only in the last year that that is a, is, a, is a really big central part of the NHS now, and they have a chief sustainability officer. And it has a plan now to be reducing its environmental impact and not just carbon emissions over the course of the next couple of decades. Now, that isn't enough to deal with a global problem, but my goodness, it's showing a pace of change that we've not seen for a very long time. And one of my concerns is that at this crucial moment in which the bounds uh, have opened up for people who want to deal with the environment, the environmental crisis in a progressive way, at this kind of moment where all these doors are beginning to open, we become overwhelmed by the scale of the problem. It is overwhelming. But we've got to make sure we're pushing on as many of those doors as possible in a way that's connected and collective before they're potentially closed shut by the gale of this growing environmental situation. And so within the context of the current moment, all, all of the amazing political movements that may inspire you if you're looking at the environmental crisis, everything from Fridays to the Future all the way through Extinction Rebellion, the Sunrise Movement in, in the US, and then the whole plethora of things that are going on in countries around the world and have been for a very long time. Just getting involved with that energy is 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 the thing right now. You know, this is this is the biggest challenge. This is the moment to be bringing ourselves to bear on it, and the potential for change is is astonishing at the moment. We must recognise that. Matt, what could people do? Well, it goes back to your point, Aaron, which is about you know this is a question of politics, and therefore it's a question of power. So it's really about how we can you know and what we can begin to build is collectivities, collective forms of power. So really, it's about you know hearing that creating leverage at points in the system, whether it's political system, economic system, social institutions, and that's how you make progress. So really it'll be about like, look, what are the movements that you really care about? What are the movements that where you live? What are the movements you can connect with? Whether that's you know, tenants unions, whether that's migrant rights unions, whether that's trade union movement, there's a whole, you know, join all of them really. Um, but be careful, you know, sort of, you know, practice self-love and care at the same time. So like, there's a whole host of areas where we really begin to need to accumulate and build power. And that's partly about sort of, you know, traditional sort of, you know, um, formal parliamentary systems. But it's also about building social power out and beyond that and in antagonism with it to begin to sort of, you know, create that accumulation of power rapidly in a whole series of overlapping institutions and spheres that we can then begin to leverage. So, you know, I think that would be the, the sort of key one. And it's, you know, this is by nature sort of a collective thing. There'll be no, no one will be coming to save us. And one thing we've got to um, be, be looking at into the future is that all of that has got to be robust to the fact that environmentally this is going to get worse. And there is a little bit of complacency, I think, when we think about the frame of the environmental crisis. It's, it's sort of stuck in a tyranny of binaries of, of save the world or what presumably the world ends on the 1st of January 2030 when we haven't decarbonized the, the world by 45% or whatever. And in many respects, you could say that the frame over the last number of decades, at least in countries like the UK, has been warning of a storm in the distance that we need to change bearing and we will then avoid. Now, that didn't happen, and we accelerated towards the storm. <laughs> and our, our policies, as well as our strategies for getting those things to happen in the world, need to be robust to the impact of being in that storm. And that is a very scary thing to have to comprehend, but it's absolutely essential. And if you are a certain age or below, 
that's the reality that you're going to have to face. You've got to make mm. sure that you're not getting overwhelmed by um, people of a certain age saying, oh, well, if it gets to this point, then, well, then it is too late. You have to say, well, hang on a minute. The, the moment of it being too late is the future in which I will become a leader. Yeah. I will be trying to make this change. And that is overwhelming, but that is just the nature of the challenge that we face. And so we need to make sure that we are we are being absolutely, we're keeping our eye on the ball and we're making sure that all that we're doing is robust to a more destabilized and destabilizing future. And that we're constantly saying to those people who say, oh, it's going to be too late or, or you know, becoming overly fatalist that, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. And boomers can't be doomers. Boomers can't be doomers. <laughs> I, I was going to say something, you know what, that's a perfect place to finish. And that for me is the big takeaway from the book. And I think it's why it's a really useful, important, interesting book is that the number one thing people can do who care about climate change, yeah, of course, change your consumption patterns, proselytize and tell people they can do this, but not that, whatever. But the number one thing is to think in terms of systems, think in terms of structures and realize that climate change didn't start 10, 20, 50 years ago. It goes like hundreds of years. I think that's so important systemic long-term thinking. So thanks again to Matt and Laurie for that. Now, if you're a regular listener or viewer of Downstream here on Navarro Media, you know what I'm going to say next. Yes, we love the fact that you've already liked this video because I know you have and you've subscribed to the channel. You can go that extra yard by going to navarromedia.com forward slash support, make a one-off payment, or you can become what we call a supporter, helping us produce our work, taking it to an ever bigger audience. We didn't talk about it during that show, but I think a pivotal part of breaking with the status quo on hydrocarbons and fossil fuel capitalism is a new media for a different politics. Help us do that. Go to navarramedia.com forward slash support. My name is Aaron Bastani. We will be back with Downstream again next Tuesday. I hope you tune in and have a great week.